I've been honored during the past few days. Number one, simply by being here. Number two, at having the opportunity to join the most incredible group of speakers that I've listened to and to be one of those speakers. And today, especially, to present to you my thoughts on how we move from imagining the future into creating the future, because that's what's going to happen. And I think what Ariana Huffington said yesterday was absolutely right. There is no white horse. The white horses are in this room. The white horses are in this room. And yinete. John said it yesterday. He said that the people in this room are capable of reinventing Greece. And I have absolutely no doubt about that. A number of speakers yesterday made reference to, oops, to life as a journey. And indeed, life is a journey. And I was making the journey this morning from the apartment that I'm staying in up here. And I came across this motor car from New Jersey, New Jersey, sorry, <laughs> uh, with vanity plates that said one papu. And there were three generations sitting inside there. And it made me think of the journey that all of us go through, that we've been through as Greeks. My own journey starts on the island of Imvros. I met two guys from Imvros last night. They're probably going to turn out to be cousins at some point. I'm sure about that. My grandmother went to South Africa in 1922. And I often think of the courage that that must have taken to get onto a boat and go to the bottom tip of Africa. No internet to check what the weather's like. Nobody to call up and say, is it true that lions eat people down there? You get on a boat and you go. And once you're there, you can't say, I don't like it, I'm going back. You're stuck. Okay? And it's out of that kind of background that we've all been born. It's a background of yinete. I got a father who, I had a father, who from the, the youngest age I can remember, always taught me about possibility. He always taught me that I can do whatever I want to do. And the journey of my own life, I always acted that way. And it's a journey which I was very fortunate. It took me from South Africa to Hong Kong, to Greece, to Mexico, to New York. And then I decided to go back to Greece because I like it best. I like it best. In fact, I love it. And that's where I am now. That journey continued. And on the 11th of November, 2011, ominous dates. Easy slide to make, 11, 11, 11. I gave a presentation in Thessaloniki, a professional presentation on branding to a group of 250 business leaders. Papandreou and Samaras were supposed to be there. It was the date that the government flipped over and they weren't there. And I was annoyed that day. And I gave a professional talk with passion because I was annoyed. This thing was put onto YouTube. I didn't put it onto YouTube. And all of a sudden, it just caught fire. 30 minutes in English on branding. It took fire. And all of a sudden, a guy who's used to creating brands became a bit of a brand, which is weird. It's really weird. I'm still getting used to this. It's really weird. And the journey kind of like continued from there. And because of that, I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people. I had the opportunity to share ideas. I had the opportunity to meet amazing people. And I found that this whole thing resonated. And I had amazing messages coming back to me through Facebook, through Twitter, where people were saying, hey, you've just said what I've always felt inside me. You've said it. Okay? And by the way, I must remind you about something. I am not a politician. I'm a marketing guy. That's all I am. 
My filter is that of a marketing guy. I don't try to give people what they want. I'm not selling anything. I'm simply expressing what I feel professionally. And what I feel professionally is that we can do it. We have to do it. Because we can't beg our way out of this crisis. We can't borrow our way out. We thought once upon a time that we could steal our way out. We can't do that. We know it now. We have to create our way out of this crisis. There is no other way forward. And yinete. I'm damn sure about that. Frank Sinatra. I think we need to make a remix of this song with Buzukia in the background. <laughs> if you can make it here, you'll make it anyway. Because those guys make it very difficult. They make it very difficult. But yinete. So the song might go, if you can make it here, you will make it anywhere. <laughs> Ramos or Ruvas? We'll have to decide who's going to do it. <laughs> I swear to you, somebody's going to make this T-shirt. I swear to you. That's going to be on sale in Placa this year. And somebody's going to make a fortune out of that. Why? So they can buy that. Larry says the capital of the Porsche Cayenne. <laughs> the European subsidies that were meant for tractors went for Porsche Cayennes, I believe. Ftani pia, se parakalo, ftani, ftani. It is time to trade the pursuit of wealth for the pursuit of possibility. We've been pursuing wealth. An $8 Nescafe Frappe is the pursuit of wealth. Creating true added value creates possibility. It gives you sustainability. Okay? This is what I set up in Thessaloniki. We are Greeks, we have the power to imagine, and now it is time to imagine the future. And it stayed in the realm of the theoretical. Time to create the future. Somebody said to me, this is the wrong way around. That says the future to create time. I said, hey, don't you travel along a road? <laughs> it's a long road. It's a hilly road. But it's got to be traveled. We have to travel it. It is our foremost task and responsibility. And Greg said it. It's about those people. They've got to hold that flag. They have to hold that flag. Stormy weather, but unity. As long as we step up, as long as we step up, we're not waiting for anybody to come and save us from this. In fact, yesterday, Paul was saying, Paul from Kokomo, who I think is phenomenal, so simple, so beautifully simple, so Greek in that simplicity, right? You know, he was saying that the crisis is a good thing because we're going to learn here how to become simple again. And I agree with him. I agree with him. It's an uncomfortable thing to say because people are suffering. But we can learn through this. We have a golden opportunity to come out of here much better than we've ever been, at least for the past 40 years. We need to do that. <laughs> I want to just go through some of the underlying reasons, reasons which I believe are at the root of this. Because if you think about it, there is no such thing as a financial crisis. It's a crisis of behavior which leads to financial issues. You don't just get into financial crises. You do something wrong and the score comes in wrong. Okay. And I think that 
what I settle on is what I've called cultural diversion. And I want to just run you through this very quickly, because I think it's important. We got frozen in time with this wonderful world of the 60s. Mercuri, Khadzidaki, Maria Callas, Onassis, culminating in this wonderful image over here, but frozen in time. And as I said yesterday, for whoever was there, this over here has a double-edged sword. Because people love this character, but not when they feel they're paying for him. And that's exactly what people feel right now, that Zorba is costing them. Athens 2004, and I was very honored recently when Dimitri Papuyanu, who was responsible for this incredible opening ceremony, pitched up at a talk I gave at the Cycladic Museum of Art in Athens. I, I think he gave such a, a wonderful gift, and I'm going to read this. It's from a, journal, a journalist who, who said this about that ceremony. The most beautiful and moving opening ceremony in Olympic history. The spectacular event told the story of a country steeped in pride for its remarkable cultural heritage. A country which has made an incredible contribution to modern civilization. The ceremony captured the, the Greek joy of life, the soul, heart and spirit of a newly transformed modern nation. It gave vision for the future. It gave Greece a role in the modern world. That was only seven, eight years ago. That's the most incredible description of a country. I love that. That's what I'm Greek for. Because of that, I feel that. Don't you? And we took the International Broadcasting Center, which broadcast that ceremony to hundreds of millions of people around the world, and we turned it into a shopping mall. Passion for fashion. This is called the Golden Hall. It's just outside Athens. And it's like Prada, Gucci, top level stuff. Which you go broke buying, right? It costs money, right? It gets you into crisis. The result of all of this, in my opinion, is cultural erosion and value erosion. Chasame to pathos mas, yamia prada. We lost our passion for a prada. Gets worse. Just when we thought we had it all, and we're running around Sonia, <laughs> that happens. And the French Minister for European Affairs says, Greece is something we can live without. Look at the body language in there. It's an unbelievable photograph. And then we get Athens in flames. And the journalists come down in droves. And the Greek man in the street says, why do you only show what is bad in Greece? You would not film this in your own country. And he has a reply from a journalist for Al Jazeera, a guy called Barnaby Phillips, remarkable piece of writing. And he says the following, what happens next in the small country on the edge of Europe affects all of us. So be it economic salvation or else disastrous default, we'll carry on reporting this story. Reporters based at the former war zones of the Balkans now rotate in and out of Greece in time for the latest strike or debt deadline. We bring tripods, light cases, and satellite phones. We look for defining images, riots in Sintagma Square, and the worst of us have got our cliches ready for our scripts. Greek tragedy, Greek drama. Never mind that for most local language skills don't extend beyond Kalimera. That won't stop the confident sounding analysis on the 24 hour news channels. And our appetite is voracious. The modern news machine is a hungry beast and we have to keep on feeding it. It's true. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. And yet we as a country do not have a crisis control mechanism in place. There's nobody dealing with this. 
Nobody. I was shocked when I heard, when I heard that. I was shocked. Instead of that, ah, we then get this piece of advertising that ran in the UK for the, the Spectator. This is designed to sell newspapers. And the headline says, most Germans own a second property. It's called Greece. Okay? By the way, I think it's a very smart headline. As a Greek, it kind of hurts me. Right? <coughs> so this is what you get. Erosion of self-esteem. I saw a piece of research the other day which ranked the image of Greece not too bad in the middle of about 130 countries worldwide. The self-esteem of Greeks was number zero, right at the bottom. And that's a huge problem. Because it's difficult to attract a girl when you don't feel good about yourself. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You've got to feel that you can do something before you do it. Otherwise, you can't do it. Yinete. But you've got to believe in yinete. I get a lot of messages on Facebook and on Twitter and on my blog site, and some of them seriously bring me to tears. Seriously. This is one of them that I want to read to you. As a Greek, I need to say that I am Greek and not be ashamed of the bad comments I hear behind my back. Please do something to restore the hurt name of every Greek who respects himself and his country and always did. I have a need to restore my name as a Greek immediately, and I believe that you can do it best, because the restoration of our living standards and a lot of other things will take longer. And she signed it, a proud Greek. Her name is Sophia Makridis. I get lots of those. Lots of them. Screw economics. By the way, I study economics. Shouldn't surprise you with a name like Economides, right? <laughs> but I've learned one thing. Economics is just a score. It's how you feel. It's how you play the game that gives you the score. You need to play a good game. And to play a good game, you've got to feel good. As you can't do it. It's very simple. Ask any of these people. You've got to feel good. You have to feel good. There's the soccer team. Alexander Payne. And 40 young people last night. You've got to feel good. What the world thinks and feels about you depends on what you think and feel about yourself. And what you think and feel about yourself depends, determines what the world thinks and feels about you. And that becomes a vicious circle. If you don't feel good, you're doomed. And here comes some, uh, one single smart word from my friend Stefano yesterday. Pesto. Pesto. Araxe. I learned a word yesterday. And I love it. Araxe. Chill, dude. But it's true. You know, a half an hour of worrying is more tiring than a week of hard work. It really screws you up. Araxe. By the way, it's difficult to araxe when you've got no food on the table. Right? This is a statement from Giscard d'Estaing, which was made at the beginning of 2010. And he said that Europe without Greece is like a child without a birth certificate. And he's right. He's damn right. And the whole world knows that. <laughs> Brilliant cover. But again, as a Greek, it kind of hurts me. Kind of hurts me. And our response is this kind of drivel. <laughs> I saw this logo, and I must say that aesthetically, I thought it was kind of cool. I was okay with it. And then I went on to the website of GNTO, and they proudly wrote the story about this logo. 
And that's when I discovered that those nine circles are the nine strategies of the GNTO. And I'm like, what? I don't believe this. Imagine Nike putting the factory on their shoes. It's the same thing. Who's interested in the nine strategies of art? And by the way, who needs a logo? You've got a flag. We've had 14 of these during the past 16 years. This particular one cost 2 million euros. Why, I ask. I'm not going to answer that. So then we get the Corruption Perceptions Index, published by Transparency International. And Greece is sitting in the Distinguished Company of Colombia, El Salvador, Morocco, Peru, and Thailand. By the way, Germany is not in the top 10, nor is the US, I'm sorry. I think you guys are in the top 20, though. <clears throat> red tape. Red tape is notorious in Greece. I remember when I arrived back in Greece, by the way, I got into a cab, and the guy says, you know, where are you from? I said, well, I, I've just moved here from New York. He said, yeah, I was in Greece, I was in Greece. His only dream was to get out of there, right? And here I was coming back. It was like, what's up with this guy? Then he says, where are you from originally? I said, from South Africa. He says, ah. Eyes light up. He says, Mandela. I said, yeah. <laughs> he says, you know that he's Greek? <laughs> so I said to him, no shit. <laughs> and he explains to me that Mandela's father was actually from Thessaloniki, and his name was Mandilas. So I said to him, drop me off the next corner, please. <laughs> and then I went to get my Adia Paramonis, my green card. And they said to me, Deborume. I said, Yati, Ise Elinas. I said, OK, so what do I do? He says, You've got to go and get a, um, a Taftotita. So I figure out where the Taftotita office is, which is like the other side of town. And I go there and I walk in and I say, can I get a taftorita? Oh, he's there, me. I said, yeah, ti, he's exenos. <laughs> what do you do? I'll tell you exactly what you do. You get yourself a lawyer, right? You give him some money and you distance yourself from what he's going to do. And he goes and he deals with it and you become part of the system. That's what you do. Okay? And the system becomes endemic. Which takes me to the next chart, doing business in Greece. This is published by the World Bank. It's an index ranking countries around the world on the ease of doing business, on things such as getting electricity, registering property, getting credit, protecting investors, paying taxes, trading across borders, enforcing contracts, resolving insolvency. We rank number 100. Ahead of Papua New Guinea, where the hell is that? <laughs> and behind Yemen, where they wipe you out if you try to start a business, you know what I mean? Not good. By the way, in Europe, Romania is number 72, Italy is number 87, Greece is 100, Kosovo is worse than us, okay, 117, and Bosnia is 125. So it's not good. It's not good at all. Next issue. As an African, sorry, as a Greek who was born in Africa, I know that that little lion over there needs a role model. If it doesn't happen, if it doesn't have one, it doesn't know how to hunt and it's going to die. It's got to have a role model. It's got to learn from its mother. We've had heroes. Look at today's heroes. <laughs> it's really sad. It's really sad. 
And this is the guy who says, Mazita fagame, cigare file. Ta fagame. I mean, you know. By the way, look at the size of the guy. He says, ta fagame. Pangalos, if you were wondering. So there are barriers over here. You've got the Greek state on the one side, and you've got Greeks on the other side, and there's a fence in between. It's tough. You've got the past and the present. You've got the future. You've got a fence in between. You've got this whole consumption mentality and the need to create, and there's a fence in between. You've got then yinete, second most popular phrase in Greek. First one is malaka. And in French, you've got yinete. Yinete. Because if it doesn't, yinete, we're in deep shit. There are some great examples of yinete. We were at one the other day, Kokomet. By the way, I was, I, I, I rode that bicycle. I don't believe, after getting married, right? <laughs> I, I like rode this bicycle the wrong way in Soho. I mean, you know, you want to go to jail? You know, just ride Kokomet's bicycle up the wrong way, the wrong, the wrong way up the street in Soho. It was ridiculous. We also try to break one of these beds. They don't break, I can tell you. Not with my wife. <laughs> try, ah, right, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, come on. Come on, give me a break. Then there's another remarkable company over here called Gia. Gia Products. Costas over here is, works for Gia, which is exporting beautiful products all over the world, 28 countries right now, including Russia. There's a company called Apivita. Remarkable, remarkable. And my friend Michalis Butaris is now building a vineyard in China. Wow. You know why, it's an interesting story. There are a couple of Greeks in China who make dolmades there. I don't know if you know this. Um, and the reason why they do it in China is that the productivity of Chinese in rolling dulma, this is really good, spring rolls, you know? So, <laughs> I, think, I think the max that you'll get out of a Greek is like three and a half thousand a day. They're doing like 5,000 a day there, right? Per person. So they're doing dulma, this, but they don't have enough leaves. So they spoke to Michalis, who said, okay, I'll do a vineyard, and I'll give you the leaves, and I'll do the wine. It's a true story, by the way. And now we've got... Dolmades and wine in China. Yinete. Yinete. Big time, Yinete. Big time. There's something, however, that I heard yesterday all the time. And it was about the relationship between the producer and the product. And it applies to all of these people that I'm talking about. Diane said, personal relationship between the producer and the product is key. And she's right. You've got to love what you're doing. Otherwise, don't do it. It's got to be a personal relationship and a Greek relationship, by the way. Paul said it. Paul said it so beautifully well when he said that if we made synthetic mattresses, we wouldn't do it well. We use seaweed and we make great mattresses that nobody else can make. And we love what we do, right? Paul said, I only do what I love. Plato said, at the touch of love, everyone becomes a poet. We heard some poetry yesterday. Beautiful poetry. I mean, that warrior poet, Matthew, was amazing. That's Greek. That's Greek. Stephanos was poetry yesterday. That's Greek. Andy Warhol also said that there should be a course in first grade on love. It's not an ancient idea. It's not only an ancient idea. You've got to love it. You've got to love it. We will never be good Germans, but we can be exceptional Greeks. And I think we feel the pressure right now to become good Germans. Forget about it. Would you buy a Greek Mercedes-Benz? <laughs> Would you buy German olive oil? Do you think Germans can make dolmades in China? 
Do you think Germans are crazy enough to make this bike that delivers mattresses around Manhattan? No. No. We're Greeks. We're Greeks. We've got to come to grips with the fact that we're Greeks, though. We have to come to grips with it because we're beautiful. What can I say to you? We're beautiful people. And I want to show you something that India does. I love what India does, by the way. They've done absolutely remarkable work. This over here is not written by me. It's written by a journalist commenting on what India does to promote itself. And I want to read this to you. It says, India really is, is incredible as their tourist board promotes. This amazing society who are generally so happy, loving, and generous in spirit. It is so imperfect, yet so beautiful in so many ways. It is a sharp contrast to many who are stressed about being perfect in every way. A perfection they know they can never really achieve, but spend their lives striving for. Here there is no such thing as perfection. It all depends on how you think about life and how you enjoy the fundamental means of fulfillment. Indians see themselves in the way that India promotes itself. And I want to show you a commercial that India produced. Acha. Warts and all. And then I'm talking in Volos the other day. And somebody says, you know something, we have a lot of stray dogs in Volos. Before we can get tourists here, we get rid of the stray dogs. I said, go to Africa, they've got stray lions. <laughs> and then I hear people saying, we've got to fix our product before you can brand it. No, you've got to brand yourself so you can fix it. This is something again, that India does, wonderful stuff. They're engaging the world in dialogues where they put themselves into the lead position. World's leading designers converge to co-create the future. India logs, conversations with the world. Great stuff. They put themselves into the position of leadership. By the way, we've got the right to do that. We've got the right to do that. We've never done it. We have every right to do it. World's leading photographers converge to co-create the future. Talented young minds converge to co-create the future with India. Design and innovation, enablers of India's urban future. Conversations with the world. I think that a lot is contained in the taxi driver's two statements. Where on the one side he said, why did you come back to Greece? You had a good job. He kind of hates his country on the one side, but he's also eager to seize every little thing, like Mandela, to make himself feel bigger. It's like a weird 
inferiority, superiority thing going on over there, which is wacky. I mean, we got the right to do stuff like this. Soft power. I just want to talk a bit about soft power, which to me is an incredibly important concept. And India's been using a lot of that, and you'll find a lot of really smart countries using soft power. And Diane talking about food. Food is beautiful soft power. That's exactly what she's talking about. There's a huge opportunity with food. What Cocoa Mat does for the image of Greece is remarkable. It's remarkable, right? That's soft power. Uh, I mean, by the way, there's a magazine called Monocle, which some of you may know. It's regarded as being, I mean, this is it, this, this magazine, okay? It's like it. If you're in Monocle, you're like, really cool. And Monocle really focuses on, on soft power and countries and cities. It, it's their focus. And they become incredibly influential. So if, if, if Monocle says that Sydney's the coolest place in the world to live, Sydney's the coolest place in the world to live. It's very simple. So soft power is all about attraction. It's about the magnet. It's about getting others to want what you are. Soft power is about being attractive and therefore attracting like a magnet. Soft power is not about pushing, but more about pulling. And I'll give you an example that you'll all be very familiar with. The US has got tons of hard power. Nobody's got more hard power than this. But it's also got tons of soft power. Okay? And I wonder which of the two are more effective. Okay? This pulls like crazy. The other stuff pushes. Okay? That's very soft power. It's very, very soft, but it's very, very strong. Most of us have got a relationship with Japan which doesn't extend beyond sushi. And it's a strong relationship we've got. Sorry? And easy Miyaki, you're right. There's another bit of soft power. Italy. France. Who's that? Right. Um, the UK, everything's red and the Queen. What's Cannes? Cannes is a stupid seaside city, but it's got the festival. That makes it Cannes. Okay. Bilbao was a dirty industrial city on the northern, on the northern coast of Spain until they built the Guggenheim Museum by Frank Gehry, and it suddenly became like the destination. Soft power, all of that. Dubai. And, and, you know, the countries in, in the Gulf are really in a very interesting position because they've got a lot of hard power called oil, and they know that that's going to last forever. So they're building soft power, like the world's tallest buildings, like having tennis matches on top of a hotel, like Abu Dhabi building not just a Guggenheim but also Louvre. It's going to be the first foreign branch of the Louvre Museum from Paris. And Georgetown University, which has now got a School of Foreign Service in Qatar. Not just Georgetown. Stanford's there. Texas A&M's there. So they are understanding that their hard power is going to run out. They're building lots and lots of soft power. Lots and lots of it. Okay? And they're importing it. Museums. Universities. A nation's soft power potential is a function of the strength, universality, and attractiveness of its culture and values. Wow. Wow. Who's got more soft power than that? Nobody. Nobody. But then what do we do? We squander it. There's a New York Marathon. There's a London Marathon. There's a Boston Marathon. There's a Berlin Marathon. There's a Chicago Marathon. There's a Rio Marathon, there's a Paris Marathon, and there's no goddamn Marathon Marathon. We got the mother of all marathons. In fact, 12 years ago, when I went back to Greece from New York and I was full of idealistic stuff, I called up the guy who ran the marathon. It's called the Athens Marathon, and it's not big. It should be the biggest marathon in the world. It should be the biggest marathon in the world. And until recently, it was called the Spiros, not the Spiros Louis, it was called the Gregorio Lambraki Marathon. It should be the Marathon Marathon. You've got it. It's yours. It's yours. The Marathon. Thank you. 
The brain drain, the last issue I want to deal with before I tell you what I think we ought to do, <laughs> which I think is probably the most critical issue of them all. This photograph was taken in 1989 when the young kid was shot by police, um, Rigoropoulos, if I'm not mistaken. But it could have been taken in Madrid with the Indignados. It could have been taken in New York with the 99% movement, or in London. It could have been taken in the 60s, funnily enough, when again there was a lot of social disconnection, a lot of fear. It could have been taken in 2011, 2012 in Athens. This kid will realize his dreams. You will not stop him. He will realize his dreams. He will. And if he doesn't pack up and leave, maybe he'll disrupt society because he's not going to be happy to be suppressed. He's not going to be happy. This is a site which was developed in Greece called The Daily Secret. Uh, what The Daily Secret is, it's like a Groupon, but it gives you daily tips on what's cool and happening in your city so that you can figure out what you want to do. It gives you insider tips on your city. And it started in Athens. There's one in Thessaloniki. There's one in San Francisco. There's one in Shanghai. There's one in Istanbul. There's one in Vancouver. There's one soon in Tel Aviv and in three other cities. And this kid has just received two million in funding from US investors. Bye bye, baby. Goodbye. Goodbye. He has a global business that we just lost. And global hope that we just lost. And global despair that we've just created. Because all of his peers understand that he's been financed outside of Greece. What do they start pursuing? Outside of Greece finance. Startup Chile. Um, Startup Chile is a remarkable program which was put together by the Chilean government. And I'm going to show you a little video which will tell you exactly what it is, so I'm not going to even say a word about it.
we've actually got somebody here who was part of the first group into Startup Chile, am I right? Would you like to quickly say a couple of words? Yeah, one of our 40, under 40s. Michael, would you like to say a couple of words? Sure. Um, I uh, didn't expect anything going into it. Um, didn't know anything about Chile. Um, probably, I mean, who, who here knows or they think they know anything about Chile or wine. what it's, wine? I mean, yeah. Cold. Cold. Chile, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got there, I was instantly amazed and surprised. Um, not only did they have everything ready for us, they made the whole process very simple. Sure. Um, they, uh, they made the whole process very, very simple. Um, we got there, they had us, they greeted us with open arms. Oh, they had a wonderful office for us. I guess the most important thing besides the money that we got to put towards our businesses, which by the way was, they never told us how to spend it. They never told us, you know, obviously we had to prove that it was for our business and not for wine. But um, it really changed our, my view of Chile and it really changed um, the connections that I made and so now I feel like I have another home in Chile and I feel like I could do business there and I feel like everyone I was working with, there's probably 150 other groups that were there, maybe teams of two or three, so do the math you two guys. Um, but now, not one class later, they're getting thousands and thousands and thousands of people trying to get into this program. And it's, it's only been around for less than a year. And besides the business and on the entrepreneurial and innovation district that they're building, um, everyone that was part of the program is telling all their friends, Chile is not only fun, it's safe, it's cool, it's easy to travel, and you can start a business here. And no one will bother you. So, that's all I wanted to say about it. Cool. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Time to create the future. Uh, a very important concept is, is this thing over here called the diffusion of innovation through society. Okay? It, it describes how ideas, products, innovations generally um, make their journey through society. Just to explain it very quickly, those who will recognize this as a normal distribution curve, but those who don't, on this side you're sitting at 0%, right? A product or an idea comes in to society, it starts growing slowly, it then picks up rapidly, it goes up there, that's 50% exactly at the top. The, the rate of, of growth slows down, but it carries on growing until at the end there, it finally reaches 100%. So that's what that's all about. Very importantly, there's a big chasm here that if you don't cross it, you don't make it into mainstream. And very importantly, there's another chasm there. If you don't cross that one, you don't make it into that last little section over there, okay? Let's take the iPhone as an example. Right on this side over here, you got the kids who will wait outside the Apple store for like two weeks in their tents. Um, no food, because they can't afford any food, and they just want to get the iPhone. They don't know what it looks like, they don't know what it's going to do, but they just got to have it, okay? So right at the end, the beginning, you got those guys. Next up, you've got probably a lot of the people in this room who will say, ah, that looks cool. Um, it's got the internet. I can probably use that. Um, I'm not sure, but I'll take the risk, okay? And I'm willing to pay $500, I'll get myself an iPhone, and I think it's going to be cool, right? But if it's not, it's not a big deal. So we take risk. Okay, and we go for it. We then, and this is important, because the chasm's there, remember. We then go for dinner, and we pull out our iPhones. And our buddies say, wow, what's that? We say, it's an iPhone. And we start selling. We start working for Apple. Okay? We start working for Apple. And we show them the app, and we show them this. It's like, wow, I've got to get one. They go and shop the next day. And all of a sudden, you've crossed that chasm, and you're into mass market. You're now on your way. You're doing very well. On the next little one over there, it's the guy who says, the neighbor's got one, I've got to get one. Okay? The guys at the end are, what's an iPhone? Forget about them. You're never going to sell iPhones to them. Okay? 
those are the guys right over there. So just forget about it. So that's how innovation spreads. It all starts here, and it grows, and it's got to jump over that chasm. It's very, very important. Okay? And here's the problem. Innovators and investors are sitting here, by definition. Public institutions are sitting there, by definition. Okay? There's a problem. There's a disconnect, a huge disconnect. And unless there's policy, and John was talking about this yesterday, for example, Chinese, uh, China's got policy to force innovation. These two cannot meet each other easily. Okay? And in Greece, that connection is very big. So these guys need to come down and connect on this side. You can't expect these guys to go and connect there. Ain't going to happen. Because these are innovators, remember. Okay? Don't hold your breath. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. Greece needs ideas. Greece needs an identity. Greece needs innovators. And Greece needs investors. And it's urgent. Okay? Even if those guys were willing to move down that curve, it'll take them years. They're not going to do it in time. We don't have years. Okay? We've got startup Chile, who's going to pull people away. We've got Germany who's going to pull people away, okay? We're in trouble. That's why Yinete. I'm going to tell you about the new initiative that I've been dreaming about for a long time and I've been working on for a long time. And yesterday, talking about journeys the last few weeks have been the most incredible journey, and I was talking to John about this, that everything is just like falling into place remarkably well. And I want to take you through where it's at right now and describe to you exactly what it is, okay? It's a microcosm of the future, is the best way that I can describe it, okay? It's creating the future in a bite-sized chunk, okay? It's about creating the Greece that can and should be. Okay? It's a physical place. It's not just an idea. It's not a website. It's a physical place. And I'll tell you about that. It's got walls. It's got doors. It's an incubator for innovation. It's a showcase for the world of what Greeks can do and what the future looks like and its inspiration within Greece. Because we said Greeks need inspiration and they're not getting it from Mr. Bangalos. The people who live in this place, who work there, are innovators, creative services. I'll talk more about these, by the way. There's a hard and soft power balance. So on the one side, you've got real engineering, technical innovation, scientific in, in, uh, innovation. You've also got dolmades. Okay? By that, I mean food, fashion, design, art, architecture. Okay? There's a conference center. This should be the hub for really cool conferences, which showcase and inspire, and there's exhibition space, okay? Exhibition space is important. We're a country full of inspiration. We need to be present. The other things inside this place are investors, mentors, and advisors. You can't change the way that government works in Greece overnight. So the advisors are there to give you legal and tax and financial advice on how to make your way through it in the most effective way. We ain't going to change anything overnight. It accepts the status quo. It says, we've got that to work with. Let's make it happen. Okay? 
They're also corporate sponsors. Okay? They're also corporate sponsors. For example, I've been speaking to a very large global technology giant who wants to turn this into a technology showcase, a global technology showcase, to showcase the very best of what's happening today in technology. And they'll put their name on it. And I want their names on it. It's a private initiative which will hopefully grow into a public-private partnership. My experience tells me that if you start private initiatives and they're good, the public comes along. If you go to the public sector and you say, I've got this idea, it's too much work for them. It's way too much work for them. Okay? Okay, they in it. Let me give you some sense of what this place is all about. Yinete, first of all, it's a global showcase. It's got to be a global breakthrough, all right? We need the world to say, wow, something's happening in Greece, okay? The world's got to say it. It's got to be located in Athens. That's the capital. It's got to be located there. The logo is inspired by three things. It's a Google place marker, which I guess we've all seen on Google Maps. It's also a light bulb. It's also an olive tree. Okay? All of these are ideas of growth, of expansion, of ideas, of identity. Okay? It's next to the sea. In Athens, what we tend to do is we say, hey, we want to be in New York. And we go and we build like lofts in the middle of the city. Forget about it. Right? Forget about it. I see Chris Ansos here smiling. He's got the most amazing place called Island, right, which is on the sea. It's amazing. That's where it's got to be. Chris Ansos, I'd love to take... Would you give me Island for this, please? It would just be amazing. <laughs> Or the Next Innovation Conference. It's got to be next to see. Because we are Mediterraneans, right? We are the, yeah, we're not, we're not New Yorkers. This is the location. It's the whole, the old Hellenicon Airport. I've had extensive discussions with the company running this huge piece of land. Huge, by the way. It's three times the size of Central Park, to give you some dimension. The whole of Monaco fits inside there. And somebody wants to turn it into a big park. I wonder if they've checked the bill for maintenance on a big park of that size. So the location is there. And it's specifically up there. There are three old hangars there, which were built during the 30s and the 40s. They're the most beautiful structures you've ever seen in your life. They're beautiful. Huge aircraft hangars. I'm going to show them to you. There they are. There are three of them. This over here is going to become a museum of architecture. It's already been earmarked for that. The middle one is available. And that one over there is available. My preference is the little one at the top, which is just beautiful. I'm going to show it to you in a second. Just beautiful. By the way, the master plan for this development calls for this area here to be green parkland. So these will land up in the middle of green parkland. Okay? And they're protected buildings. They're listed. So they can't be destroyed. That's the one. That's what it looks like right now. It's an old Second World War hangar. The one next to it's got some bomb holes at the top. That's what it's like inside. It's 15 meters high, and it's 60 by 60 meters in size. 15 meters is like 50 feet. 60 meters is like 200, I guess. It's big. It's big. This is, I used to work for TBWA. This is our agency in, uh, in Venice, California. 
This was done by Frank Gehry. And it's got, it's got to have this kind of philosophy of architecture. It's got to be a really cool place that the whole world's going to say, wow. Okay. Inside, it's inspired by that. It's inspired by that to produce that kind of feeling. Okay? Or those kind of feelings. These are benchmark creative workspaces. Google's multiplex is on there. TBWA Shire Day is on there. The coolest spaces in the world are on there. We've got to create something cooler than this. Okay? The idea, by the way, is, use, is to use Greek architects working in collaboration. They'll probably kill each other in the process, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the slogan, a place for ideas to grow, and I've put the ID in a different color because it's a place for ideas and identity to grow. We've got to get back the identity of being innovators. We're idea people, that's who we are as Greeks. I want to show you this. The West Coast headquarters of leading global ad agency, TBWA, Shiat Day, opened in 1998 in a large renovated industrial warehouse in Los Angeles. Ten years later, we take a cinematic look at their evolving creative culture. In 1998, the intention was to create a kind of advertising city, a creative village, unifying the 450-person community. In the subsequent 10 years, the agency has doubled in size within the same footprint and remains a vibrant community producing some of the world's greatest creative advertising. For guests coming in the gatehouse, you're surprised as you walk down this tube, you can't see anything, and you step out and it's just this giant space filled with colors and shapes and your line of sight goes all the way to the end of the building. Nothing really interrupts your line of sight so you, you can see the spaciousness. Um, it's fun to watch people walk in the building. I, you can always tell someone who doesn't work here because they walk around like this. For the first 10 minutes they're just, they don't even talk, they just look. Uh, you can see them trying to take it in and, and uh, see everything. I think it, it works great in, in terms of uh, uh, the results and the results if you if you look at you know the creativity in terms of awards and and the quality of work that uh, that we're doing uh, I think it really supports that the whole genesis for this space was really uh, more of a advertising city concept and um, you can tell by just looking around the building that it's it's based upon uh, the concept that there, it's a city. And, um, it was really the outgrowth of, uh, I think, a lot of programming that uh, Clive spent a lot of time, you know, just really getting to understand our company, the culture, how we work, um, the environment, and um, and I think all that planning and, and understanding up front paid off. So that's, that gives you an idea of the, the philosophy behind the space, okay? So it's really, really a universe called the hangar, and inside that, there's the future, a microcosm of the future, okay? I want Monocle to write this kind of stuff about it. The rebirth of creativity, this is where we want to work. Monocle reports the Unity Project in Athens. If they say that, you're the coolest place in town. Not in town, on the planet. Okay? That's what we're going to aim at doing.
the coolest place on the planet. Yesterday, there was a section on, I can't even say that word. Philanthropreneurism. I did it. And this is actually what it's all about, okay? This is actually what it's all about. And I want to just explain to you how this thing will come into being. Uh, first of all, this quote here from Richard Branson, which I think is just spot on. The boundaries between work and higher purpose are merging into one, and doing good really is good for business. Okay? It really is good for business. We've got a wacky thing in, Greek, in Greece. We've got the most conservative left wing in the world. Right? This guy's unbelievable. And somehow, this idea of you know, being creative is, is not a cool idea. You know? it's, it's like, you know, you're not supposed to make money. Okay? This is an environment for money making. Let's just be very clear about that. But the environment is built up philanthropically. And let me explain that. It is established through philanthropy. Okay? In other words, the warehouse, sorry, the, the hangar, the architecture, the building is financed philanthropically in order to create the perfect microcosm for business through innovation to take place. There's a fund inside there called the Yenida Fund. And I'm very, very happy to be able to tell you that even though it's relatively early stage on this, that a certain amount of money has already been committed and it's quite substantial. I can also tell you that International Life, which is one of the largest Greek insurance and financial services company, not only believes in this idea, they committed to it with hard cash. It's owned by the Bravos family. I can also tell you that Mesero, Chicago, financial services company, is committed to assisting with the establishment of this fund. And there are two gentlemen sitting right there, John and Alexander, who are the managing directors of Mesero here in New York, who will be assisting in the creation of all of this. They've already been helping a lot in terms of setting up what this fund is all about. I'm not a finance guy, I'm pathetic. Thank you very much, guys. And something I'm really psyched about is this. John. John has agreed on two things. Number one, the very first international innovation accelerator will be held at Unity. It's the very first one, okay? Innovation accelerator is something that is done by the National Science Foundation, um, which is the most remarkable institution. 196 Nobel Prizes have come out of that foundation alone, which is more than Brazil, Russia, India, China, and I should add South Africa put together. Those are the BRICS nations, okay? And the BRICS nations are aggressively pursuing innovation right now. John has also agreed, and I'm really psyched about this, to be an advisor to the project. John, thank you very much indeed. Just to give you status on a couple of other things, I'm holding conversations with a lot of major corporations, either to come in as investors or as sponsors. I do want sponsors. I think we want to showcase this as much as possible. We want to get it out there, okay, big time. Um, in terms of philanthropy, setting up the thing, um, there are a couple of options, and they're all being examined right now. Advanced stages, I should add. The one is through some of Greece's leading philanthropic foundations and the other is through corporate donations. But that's pretty much advanced at this point, okay? Yenete.
Where's my wife? <laughs> I, I really am. I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I can't tell you how I feel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to finish with this. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules. And they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them. Disagree with them. Glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do.